and it really is a thrill to have Lee with us again. Um, she has been with, uh, she honored us several years ago as our keynote presenter. And Lee is the senior fellow of the Center of the Study of Social Policy, where she works with colleagues on efforts to broaden understanding of evidence as applied to the design and evaluation of complex initiatives. She's also the lecturer in social medicine at Harvard University, and Lee founded the, and directed the Pathways Mapping Initiative to develop new approaches to building a stronger knowledge base about what works to improve outcomes for vulnerable children, youth, and families. She's also the author of two books, Within Our Reach, Breaking the Cycle of Disadvantage, and Common Purpose, Strengthening Families and Neighborhoods to Rebuild America. Please join me in welcoming Elizabeth Shore. Take it away. You see Cindy? She's right there. Now, Stephanie went right into an introduction of me, which kept us from applauding her wonderful, wonderful talk. I think she deserves a big round of applause. That was really such a great beginning to this conference. And, uh, and I like to think it just set up everything that's going to come up subsequently, including my talk this morning. Now, I am so delighted to have been asked to do this keynote, and especially because I've been asked back from having talked with you some years ago. And it's wonderful to um, be invited by people who already know you. I am reminded that when I wrote my first book, uh, Within Our Reach, my mother, who lived in Los Angeles, called me and said, you know, you're, uh, you're quoted from Within Our Reach in a column in the LA Times this morning. Uh, it, and she told me who had written the column, and she said, do you know him? And I said, no, I don't. And she said, well, would you like me to send you the clipping? And I said, yes, please. And it arrived with a little post-it note saying, it seems that even people we don't know are reading your book. <laughs> so it's nice to be asked by people who know me already. But I, I have encountered Smart Start uh, many times in the journey that brought me here the first time and this time. Um, when I wrote Within Our Reach, it was about programs that worked, and I was able to write about Smart Start already at that time. Uh, then I, when five years after Within Our Reach came out, I found that the 25 successful programs that I had profiled were either no longer in existence or they had been diluted into ineffectiveness. And I said, why is that? Uh, and that's what I wrote my second book about. And it was mainly about the context in which good programs have to exist, especially if they are going to spread and scale up, and about how we have to pay more attention to the rules, regulations, funding practices, and so on, that determine whether we're going to thrive or or um, or be diluted, uh, and certainly smart starts illustrate all of these. I was also a member of the selection committee of the Innovations in American Government Awards uh, set up by the Ford Foundation and the Kennedy School at Harvard, and, and uh, Smart Start won one of those awards in 1998. It was cited particularly for its achievement in rallying individuals, communities, community agencies, the business sector, local and state state government around three critical goals, improving the quality, availability, and affordability of child care, expanding access to preventive health services for children, and enhancing support services for families with young children. And that's what you're still doing today. But as we look at how Smart Start and similar state initiatives 
have evolved, I think we have to think about three very important changes in the context within, it, within which we now operate. First, less money. Secondly, more pressure to use proven interventions and to prove that whatever activities we undertake are achieving their desired impact. And third, as Stephanie said, we know stuff we didn't know before. There's an enormous advance in uh, the last several decades in our knowledge base, coming from brain science, our understanding of behavior, our insights into the institutional obstacles that can prevent real change. So what do we do about less money? We mobilize our expanded knowledge base to improve the effectiveness of our activities. We work harder and smarter to demonstrate our effectiveness in the hope that that will translate into greater support. And how do the pressures for proof relate to the advances in our knowledge base? First, there are the truths we have known for a long time, even before we were asked for the metrics to prove them. The basic building blocks of early child initiatives. Um, children have to have access to preventive health care. They need high quality early, early care and education programs that keep them safe and healthy and provide them with opportunities to learn the skills they need for success in school. And parents need tools that support them in raising healthy, happy, successful children. Now, the last time I was here, uh, those, uh, those building blocks didn't have quite the same meaning to me that they have now, because now I have a three-year-old grandchild. And I see exactly the, how this is illustrated in the life of my grandchild, who's one of those really fortunate kids whose parents have the resources to do well by them, who have the joy in, in, their, in their child, and um, who um, have all the supports in the community and in the neighborhood that they need. Uh, but today, we know so much more than when Smart Start began, and I must say, when I try to tell my daughter and son-in-law about all these things we're learning. They are so far ahead of me. It's amazing. Um, but what we're learning from brain science, uh, we, from, from all the other things that we're, the new learnings we're doing, we can't rely only on the interventions that were proven successful in the past to solve the challenges that remain unmet. We have to think about bigger goals than that. Now, I know how hard it is to think about bigger goals, higher goals, when you're fighting to survive. And yet, one of the ways we're going to survive is by fighting to achieve bigger goals, like reducing widespread racial e income and geographic disparities in school readiness, child health, educational achievement, child welfare, family stability. It won't be enough to implement or spread the proven programs and policies of the past, especially when we're asked to do so with reduced funds. Rather, we need the transformational interventions that lead to what pediatrician Jack Shonkoff calls breakthrough impacts. And breakthrough impacts will become more likely when past successes become the starting point and not the final destination. For that to happen, we have to get better at figuring out what has worked, what will work, and what should be considered credible evidence. Stephanie referred to the North Carolina General Assembly's declaration that uh, evidence-based practices and programs are defined as those, quote, that have repeatedly and consistently demonstrated desirable outcomes through application of experimental research methods. 
even evidence-informed practices are expected to have a history of past success. These definitions reflect the legislature's understandable determination that we act on more than anecdotes and good intentions. Fine. And there's nothing wrong with uh, insisting that public and philanthropic funds go to interventions shown to be evidence-based or evidence-informed. Nothing wrong with that, as long as our definition of evidence, of credible evidence, is sufficiently inclusive. It can't be just a very narrow sliver of evidence to show that what we're doing works. I'm going to explain in a minute about what I mean by sufficiently inclusive a sufficiently inclusive definition of evidence and why I believe we have to go beyond experimental research methods to obtain a richer array of evidence. But I want to precede that with just a big bit of background of how we got there. Experimental research methods in the form of random assignment trials first came into their own around the treatment of breast cancer. For more than 80 years, surgeons routinely performed radical mastectomies, named the Halstead procedure for its inventor, Dr. William Halstead. Then a new breed of scholars subjected the procedure to randomized clinical trials, an evaluation that had been unknown to Halstead. Their findings appeared in 1985. It turned out that radical mastectomy had no advantage over less intrusive treatments. By the late 20th century, randomized trials were considered as the standard method for rational practice in medicine. Randomized trials began to move from medicine to the assessment of social programs in the mid-1960s. And I remember this very well because I was in the poverty program in the mid-1960s, and there were these whiz kids that had come over from the Pentagon and were ready to give everything we had a ratio of cost-effectiveness. So soon calls for evidence of effectiveness grew, usually in the form of demands for evaluations conducted by social scientists using randomized experiments in the hope of bringing a more scientific approach to social policy. Legislators moved to mandate the use of control groups and experimental design as a condition of funding. And at the same time, foundation boards were demanding objective evidence of results in their grant making. Grant making. With the support of foundations and federal contracts, a substantial research industry grew. Web-based clearinghouses appeared featuring lists of interventions certified by experimental trials. Now, those of us who were saying that evaluating complex social programs was not like testing a drug or a surgical procedure. We're, it was hard for us to speak up because we were at risk of being considered unscientific. Warnings that the most promising interventions to give young children a start, good start in life, to rescue inner city schools, strengthen families, rebuild neighborhoods, were not standardized and should not be standardized and therefore could not be experimentally assessed. Uh, <clears throat> but these warnings gained little traction. If successful programs tended to incorporate multiple components requiring constant mid-course corrections flexible adaptation to local circumstances new and new contexts, rather than stable chemicals manufactured and administered in uniform doses, 
Some even thought that the answer was to make social interventions uniform, never mind this business of that they have to be responsive to cultural context to different populations and so on, but make them uniform so that they could be properly assessed. So a lot of both producers and consumers of evaluation research were intimidated into accepting a narrow, impoverished definition of evidence as the only evidence worth having. Policymakers, in particular, found it hard to resist the idea that you can actually rely on proof from numbers to identify the social interventions worth investing in, freeing both public and philanthropic funders from having to make fallible judgments. Uh, an economist colleague of mine, Bob Hollister, explains that randomized clinical trials are like the nectar of the gods. Once you've had a taste of the pure stuff, it's hard to go to sit and settle for flawed alternatives. At the same time, on the ground, program managers, designers, practitioners began to notice that the interventions that seemed most likely to result in significant improvements in how outcomes were hard to assess by experimental methods. They were complex. They had to be adapted to a variety of cultures and populations. They required reforms in institutions, policies, systems, and they were continually evolving in response to changes in context, lessons learned, and advances in knowledge. This would suggest that if we are aiming for real change, if North Carolina and other leading state initiatives are once again to show the way, that work has to be informed by more than lists of programs that were once proven effective with experimental evaluations. Even experimentally proven programs may not maintain their effectiveness as they are spread to new sittings, settings. Um, despite the research community's ability to identify promising programs, there is almost no evidence that it is possible to take such programs to scale in a way that maintains their effectiveness without adapting them. So that's why we have to do more than spread proven programs with fidelity to the original. That's why we have to think about evidence much more inclusively. And that's why I say there's nothing wrong with insisting that funds go only to interventions shown to be evidence-based as long as our definition of credible evidence is not so narrow that it leaves us with only a cramped universe of interventions. Um, we can have the next slide, uh, which is an effort, my feeble effort to do graphics, um, to show uh, that the evidence from experimental evaluations is only one small piece of the evidence that we need to be able to draw on. We also have to have evidence from other kinds of evaluations, from other research, from theory, and certainly from practice and experience. Um, so, these elements of an inclusive evidence base suggest while that our Past, past, past focus has been on findings of experimental program evaluations. We need a much broader range of evidence so that we can draw on this rich array of evidence to improve co program quality, guide the selection and design of interventions for implementation or scale up, and to make proven programs more effective. Uh, so we can do the next slide, I think. Yes. Um, 
I just want to cite a few examples of how the diverse knowledge from theory, research, and practice should inform current and future efforts to achieve breakthrough impacts. For example, we know from research that children in foster care do better when they're in fewer out-of-home placements. We may not have the programmatic information about what kind of interventions are routinely effective in bringing about fewer placements. But non-programmatic research and experience can still guide action and resource allocation. Another example, the Harvard Center on the Developing Child has pulled together the latest findings on the effects of early experience on a child's brain architecture and the body stress response systems. It documented the significant reductions in later damaging outcomes such as diabetes, hypertension, cardiovascular disease, even various forms of cancer, as well as depression, anxiety, addictions, and other mental health impairments that could be realized if we could decrease the number and severity of early adverse experiences and toxic stress and strengthen the protective relationships that prevent early toxic stress. But the research here does not yet give us the interventions. It just tells us that we should be aiming toward everything that we know that protects against and prevents toxic stress and early adverse experiences. Uh, another example of how we could improve outcomes by applying the lessons from research and practice and add these to proven programs comes from the Nurse Family Partnership, which most of you are familiar with. Nurse Family Partnership tested its model in three randomized trials beginning 34 years ago in Elmira, New York, with consistent, if sometimes modest, results. Especially, what was most consistent was prolonging the interval between first and second births. Now, as you know, the NFP is widely considered the most rigorously proven early intervention. The NSP model, however, has been basically frozen in time for three decades. To maintain its proven status, it has not been adapted to take account of the explosion of knowledge in the last two decades. If communities could build on what we know from research and experience, they would expand eligibility to include the 62% of mothers who are not first-time teen mothers. They would include mothers who had received no prenatal care. They would enlist partners who've worked successfully with parents suffering from what the Harvard Center on the Developing Child has identified as the two most common precipitants of toxic stress in children, parental substance abuse and postpartum depression. They would add capacity to deal with crises arising from domestic violence or homelessness. They would extend home visiting services and efforts to upgrade care beyond formal settings to family, friend, and neighborhood caregivers who care for 41% of low-income children under age five with employed mothers. Now, adding these missing components to proven programs, linking them to each other, to supportive systems and a strong infrastructure, vastly increases the chances of achieving transformative outcomes at greater scale. But when I talked about, you're right, this is important. When I talked about this at a meeting of the um, GEO, Grant Makers for Effective Organization, a woman came up to me and she said, I'm from Rochester, New York, United Way, and we figured out what you figured out. Not only that we had to add these additional capacities, but we also figured out that homelessness and housing were a huge factor. So we added 
a housing specialist to our program. But she said, we were told that we might not qualify for federal funds because this was no longer a proven program. So that's what we have to really insist on, that we be able to build on programs, build on proven programs, to make them more successful with the knowledge that we have. And that's why evidence-based does not have to mean experimental-based. Uh, all of these examples illustrate how important it is to apply knowledge from theory, many kinds of research and practice, and to strengthen current, in order to strengthen current and future efforts to achieve breakthrough in cap, uh, impacts. Now, once we understand that evidence-based does not have to mean experimental-based, we have to be clear about how to match various evaluation methods to different types of interventions. It is, it is important to use randomized assignment, uh, randomized experiments to assess interventions that are conceptually neat, have a linear, tightly coupled causal relationship to the outcome we're trying to achieve. Um, early education provides several examples of useful randomized trials. Uh, take North Carolina's Abecedarian project, which I'm sure a lot of you know. It's designed in the 1970s to provide intensive, high-quality childhood education from infancy to kindergarten. Uh, Following participants to adulthood, it found that they had better scores on math and reading tests while in school, less teenage parenthood, were four times more likely to earn a college degree than the control group. Along with the better known Perry Preschool Project, Abbasidarian was the basis for calculations which we have all heard about by the Nobel Prize winning economist James Heckman, showing the very substantial payoff from early intervention. Now that is a proper use of random assignment experiments. But we have to use non-experimental methods to assess interventions that are place-based, that are not circumscribed, that are complex, that evolve, that are changing from place to place, changing over time, changing because they are learning from experience, because so many of our unsolved problems are what business people call adaptive problems. They are not technical problems. Uh, <clears throat> they are striving for what um, has been called collective impact. In an important article on collective impact, uh, John Kanya and Mark Kramer distinguish between technical problems which an expert or a circumscribed manualized intervention can fix. And they distinguish between that and the adaptive problems that require solutions that involve collective impact because they are achieved by the contributions from many different sources. Now that makes it very, very hard to assess experimentally, and we shouldn't try. Um, <clears throat> many of the initiatives represented here are based on this understanding with partnerships that collect data to assess children's well-being and their ability to bring together families, teachers, doctors, dentists, libraries, schools, and many others to, to meet children's varied needs and the varied needs of their families. Let's take another example, the Harlem Children's Zone, working to reweave the family, the social fabric of Harlem and the inspiration for today's promised neighborhoods. Home Children's Zone has developed a network of interventions to address health, education, early childhood, family support, and community building. Their infrastructure, which is what accounts for the whole being more than the parts, 
seeks to ensure that all the children in the zone stay on track from birth to college graduation and entry into the job market. This backbone of support and its complex in inputs and outcomes are very hard to reduce to quantifiable measures. One reason, and that's one reason why the Harlem Children's Zone is difficult to evaluate with experimental designs. They point out that none of their programs, except for their schools, have been subject, subjected to randomized experiments because they say such a research design and the attendant denial of services associated with it are inconsistent with our mandate to serve all the imperiled children living in our designated area. So to learn about the effectiveness and impact of interventions that are place-based, that are evolving, that it is essential to collect rigorous data and compare results, but without expecting to find a perfect comparison group that would prove causality. It's it's essential to have some way of comparing results to establish, not with certainty, but beyond a reasonable doubt, that the change you've observed has a high probability of resulting from the practices and strategies and policies that you are implementing, and not from factors like selection bias that produce markedly non-comparable populations. But the community-specific nature of many place-based interventions make it hard to find a comparison group that would allow for precise causal attribution. In place-based efforts to change whole neighborhoods or improve the well-being of whole populations, the causal connections are bound to be diffuse and most counterfactuals are impractical. But it's possible, as Smart Start has done, to use outcome data for widely sought, publicly reported results such as school readiness, school achievement, the absence of preventable health problems. Using these data, it's possible to compare outcomes among the populations of children and families served by a specific initiative to, for instance, similar populations in the geographic area before the intervention began, national, state, or local norms. These kinds of comparison groups constitute a, what is called a counterfactual that doesn't offer mathematical certainty but does provide useful knowledge when it's applied with intelligence and common sense. But that's not all. The statewide setting of Smart Start and other state-based interventions provides an unusual opportunity to synthesize learning, to put together learning across successful interventions, to generate hypotheses about, and to identify and build on what works. Uh, I think we can use the next slide. So when, when you synthesize across successful interventions, you can identify and build on their core components. One study of useful synthesis came from Joseph Durlach and Roger Weisberg's review of 66 evaluations of after-school programs on nine different measures of youth, social, behavioral, and academic performance. They were able to identify four characteristics common to all of the effective programs. Each had a sequenced approach, got youth actively involved in learning, was focused on a few goals, and had activities that were explicitly tied to those goals. Another example of useful th synthesis, not in the early childhood field, but it illustrates the principle, reviewed 500 some programs aimed at reducing recidivism among delinquent youth. 
the Center for Juvenile Justice Reform at Georgetown University, looked at research on effectiveness measured by rates of recidivism and looked for the patterns that occurred across successful programs. Um, it turned out that much of the program's effectiveness could be accounted for by a very small number of straightforward factors. Uh, the decision to target high-risk cases and to take a therapeutic approach to changing behavior rather than a control or deterrence philosophy. The researchers concluded that close attention to these factors in the selection and implementation of programs for juvenile offenders could provide reasonable assurance that those programs, whether or not they were named programs, whether or not they were proven programs, would help reduce recidivism. When you identify the elements of successful programs by cross-program synthesis, funders don't have to make a yes or no choice of funding a proven program or defunding a program that has not been proven. Rather, as Carol Emig at Child Trends points out, future funding can be tied at least in part to retooling existing programs and services so that they have more of the elements of successful programs. Second thing you can do is you can identify and build on the core components of successful implementation. It's tempting to think about core components mainly in programmatic terms, but effectiveness depends as much on the quality of implementation as it does on programmatic content. Sorry. <laughs> Some of the critical non-programmatic conditions of successful implementations, implementation that cut across many domains include adequate funding, a shared sense of urgency, clear goals for the desired change, agreement on how to judge success, an influential champion, and an understanding that change takes time. And that understanding, of course, has to be shared not, by the, not just by the people who run the programs, but by their funders. A focus on spreading the identified components of effectiveness may be more promising than going to scale by replicating models. Because even pro proven programs are seldom so strong that the whole self-contained package will be successful regardless of the circumstances in which it's replicated. The Carnegie Foundation for the Advancement of Teaching has concluded that the integrity of implementation is a better goal than the fidelity of implementation because integrity can remain true to the essential ideas while being responsive to varied conditions and contexts. Third, you can also identify and build on the core components of successful contexts. Probably the greatest failures in implementation have resulted from viewing the challenge too narrowly and not taking enough account of how contextual conditions interact to promote success or failure. Uh, the co-director of the National Implementation Research Network says that successful implementation is synonymous with coordinated change at system, organization, program, and practice levels, a coordination that is rarely achieved, but is really worth working toward. Now, <clears throat> the, uh, I think I'm ready for the last slide. The last point I want to make is how vast are the opportunities that are presented by an expanded knowledge base. Foremost among these opportunities is that, and Stephanie referred to this too, interventions do not have to be limited to programs. 
That insight was part of Smart Start since its origins. The original request for Smart Start funding stated that what is required are new models of action, new levels of commitment and collaboration among state leaders, new public-private partnerships that build local capacity, promote leadership development, and foster deep and lasting collaboration. It's possible that place-based interventions that target whole populations uh, and that are like those many of you are promoting are among the most promising strategies. Circumscribed, definable, programmatic interventions are important tools in our efforts to achieve better outcomes. But we can't march program by program into the better future that we are seeking. What works to achieve better outcomes is a broader and more complicated question than what programs work. It's easier to focus on programmatic fixes that we can get elegant research about while ignoring the need for more fundamental change. We tend to rank programs by the persuasiveness of their research findings and we fail to see that this program centrism, this focus on programs, has led us to miss a lot of what matters beyond programs. Um, <clears throat> whether it's recruiting more talented, better trained, and better compensated staff, mobilizing better supports from mental health professionals to consult with home visitors or child care staff, strengthening the capacity of family, friend, and neighbor caregivers, or building tra greater trust between communities and helping institutions. The concrete results of such interventions are not quick. They're hard to demonstrate. But while, it, while these more far-reaching strategies in the world beyond programs are hard to document, we have to focus attention on how the stability of child care programs, for instance, are good not just for the development of the child, but simultaneously allow parents to feel secure about going to work. And that is not a simple outcome. That's a complicated outcome. That's an outcome that goes across systems. So <clears throat> we have to move beyond isolated programs because many of the, f better do this. I'm sorry, I came here with a cold. I didn't get it here. Many of the functions that improve outcomes require action across programs, policies, disciplines, and systems. Many successful interventions and supports are dependent on inspiring leadership, on the formation of trusting relationships, and other intangibles that are hard to measure, document, codify, and replicate. A powerful, largely unrealized potential lies in efforts that are synergistic, built on a sturdy infrastructure, but with many moving parts that have to be adapted to specific local cultures and defy mechanical replication. Lastly, we have to reach beyond programs to systems because funding and regulatory systems operate to make possible and support or to sabotage and undermine the work at the front lines that changes outcomes for children and families. This notion that the people at the front lines can do what they know needs doing without being affected by the silos in which funding comes, without being affected by the regulations that may have nothing to do with their practice. I, um, in my first book, I wrote about Sister Mary Paul, who runs a um, family support program in Brooklyn. And she said, nobody in this program ever says, this may be what you need, but it's not part of my job to help you get it. Now, I think 
Almost every frontline worker would like to be able to say that. It's very, very hard to do because that's not how the system operates. Um, <clears throat> but there are so many outcomes that are not dependent on the programmatic evidence that we are now so focused on. Recently, the Centers for Disease Control uh, released a report about life expectancy of Americans, which has increased by 30 years in the last century. Now, the consensus is that about 25 years of this gain is due to advances in public health policy, including family planning, fluoridation of drinking water, motor vehicle safety, reduction of tobacco use, safer, healthier foods, safer workplaces, decline in deaths from coronary heart disease and stroke and vaccination. Now, what's amazing about this list is that only the, the vaccine is the one that was the product of experimental studies. Experimental studies have also contributed to the decline in deaths from coronary heart disease and stroke. But motor vehicle laws, safe foods, control of infectious disease, reduction in smoking, account for the lion's share of increases in longevity. So we move beyond programs and beyond what we can learn from evaluation research, and many more opportunities open up by increasing the effectiveness of current programs, adding missing components, linking them to each other and to supportive systems, and providing infrastructure to monitor, improve, and sustain them. We have the best chance of achieving transformative results at greater scale. I want to conclude by saying that the time may be ripe for us to celebrate our victories and vow to aim higher. And aiming higher means reminding ourselves that we are engaged in the most critical work of the nation, getting our children, including the children that are being left behind, off to a good start in life so they will thrive as learners, as workers, as parents, and as citizens. I really want to thank you for inviting me to meet with you on this very important subject. As you pursue these issues over the next two days, as you deliberate on what it will take to do your work at the highest levels of quality and effectiveness, you must know that you're not alone in struggling with the challenge of learning in all the ways we can from practice and theory and research to learn how we can improve outcomes for all, especially the most vulnerable children and families that you serve. It seems to me that the people in this room are perhaps uniquely positioned to respond to the oft express challenge of our president to put our hands on the arc of history and bend it once more toward the hope of a better day. And I wish you success in your noble efforts toward that end. Thank you.